धन्यवाद प्रणाम महाराज जी थैंक यू फॉर योर एसोसिएशन एंड यू विल बी एन लाइटिंग आर स्टूडे भागवतम श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो सिक्स चैप्टर फोर फोर्टीन वर्स ट्वेंटी बट बिफोर वी मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट सेशन आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट लक्ष्मी माता जी टू गिव अ ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन फॉर महाराज हरे कृष्णा महाराज थैंक यू जी माता जी हरे कृष्णा महाराज धनवत प्रणाम हरे कृष्णा डिवोटीज इट गिव्स मी इमेंस प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस अ टुडे स्पीकर हिज होलीनेस चंद्रमौली स्वामी महाराज हिज होलीनेस चंद्रमौली स्वामी महाराज इज अ डिसाइपल ऑफ इस्कॉन फाउंडर आचार्य हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्त विदान स्वामी स्वामी प्रभुपाद एंड एन इनिशियटिंग स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर विद इन द इस्कॉन मूवमेंट महाराज इज बॉर्न इन न्यू जर्सी यूएसए इन नाइनटीन Maharaj came in contact with the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in Denver, Colorado at the age of 24. In 1973 he began practicing Krishna Consciousness in New York City and shortly after thereafter began serving at the New Vrindavan Farm Community in West Virginia. That same year he received initiation from his divine grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In 1986 His Holiness Chandramouli Swami Maharaj accepted the sannyas order and began preaching in Cincinnati and Columbus Ohio. In 1995 he began serving as a resident sannyasi in Chicago where he was based out uh, where, where he was based until 2013 when he relocated to Karlovec Croatia. At present His Holiness Chandramouli Swami Maharaj offers spiritual guidance around Europe, USA and India. there was a brief introduction about uh, his holiness chandramouli swami maharaj aditi mata ji over to you thank you thank you, thank you lakshmi mata ji for that introduction dandavat pranam maharaj ji please accept my humble obeisances and thank you for giving your value time and association over to you maharaj ुवाने translation the king's mind is fully controlled all his family members and government officers are subordinate to him his provincial provincial governors present taxes on time without resistance and what to speak of lesser servants you know probably purport and give a reach ask the king whether his mind was also under control this is most essential for happiness om gyan timiranda shya ganadana salakaya taksun militam yena tasmay shri guru vena maha maum vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shrimati bab जय श्री कृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakti Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare The Lord declares in the Bhagavad Gita in the 6th chapter that one should elevate themselves by the mind and not degrade themselves the mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy and his enemy as well in the next verse he says the one who has control the no this is 
the other verse he says that the mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and the enemy as well one who controls his mind the mind is the best of friend the one who fails to do so his very very mind is his greatest enemy and then in the next verse he says um one who controls the mind the super soul is already reach for him happiness and distress honor and not dishonor heat and cold appear all the same uh, these are three verses from the sixth chapter in that chapter it's called jnana yoga in that chapter it describes practically a whole chapter describes how to control the mind and what is the nature of the mind so the mind is the central feature of the yoga system <laughs> and when the mind is direct, controlled it is directed towards the activities of devotional service in the material world people cannot have controlled minds because the activities that they perform are under the influence of the three modes of material nature rajas tamas and sattvas and is explained in the bhagavatam that the mind that any good qualities that they may have simply are features of the ever changing mind hmm. So where are we going here? Yeah, so I, I spoke verses 5, 6, and 7 <laughs> from the 6th chapter. So in that chapter, there is a lot of dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. And as we were mentioning, the material energy works in such a way is that one cannot have a controlled mind. So as long as one is working under the influence of the three modes of material nature, no matter what they are, their mind is being dictated by that material energy. And based on their desires, the mind is being carried from one situation to another. But one who is engaged in devotional service can control the mind because the object of mind control becomes fixed. Here, it seems like something is different is being presented. If the king's mind is fully controlled, all his family members and government are subordinate to him. And then every, so here even we see that one who has the power to control the mind can influence others to perform activities also. But from the perspective of devotional service, the control of the mind becomes fixed on the absolute truth or engaged in devotional service. Therefore, it is explained that controlling the mind means to absorb oneself in the activities of Krishna consciousness. Then the mind is above the effects of the three modes of material energy, and it's actually controlled by the higher source of the spiritual source. And therefore, the mind is, the mind is uh, happy even in the material world, if a person controls their mind, as we see here, the king, uh, still, it doesn't mean they're going to find some satisfaction. That only the only satisfaction they can find is they can get the job done. But for a devotee, it's not about getting the job done. It's about purifying the mind by engaging the mind in devotional service. And the mind is the center of the yoga system. So when the mind is controlled, then uh, one is fixed in devotional service. So one has to practice mind control through the process of austerity, detaching oneself from material activities and attaching oneself to spiritual activities. Um, and that requires some determination because the mind is chanchala, it's flickering constantly moves from place to place. It never stays in one place. The mind is always active. It never stops. It goes 24 hours a day. When you sleep at night, you enter into a different state of consciousness where the mind is in a more subtle aspect and it's in, we know it as dreaming or deep sleep. 
But in both of these states of consciousness, the mind is still active. In the, in the dreaming state, we have some recollection, but in the deep sleep, we are completely oblivious to the movements of the mind at that time. But of course, deep sleep, the mind is moving slower. But in any case, the point is the mind is always moving, moving, moving. So in order to stay fixed in mental control, one has to focus their mind on something that is transcendental or spiritual, that is not within the realm of shifting, because modes are always shifting, and therefore the mind is also being dragged this way and that way by the shifting modes. And the mind is, is very difficult to understand, and Krishna explains it in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's also explained in other places in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that the mind um, uh, of, a, of a devotee is uh, peaceful. Why? Because they're engaged in devotional service. The mind of a non-devotee can never be peaceful because they're engaged in, in getting some results from the activities they perform, and therefore... They use the mind in that way, but the mind is actually using them rather than, than they use the mind. You'll see in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a nice uh, analogy that's done in the picture form. You'll see there is a chariot, and on the chariot there's two living beings, and then there is the horses, there are five horses, and then one of the one of the persons on the chariot is holding the reins that can that control the horses. And then there's the there's the driver and there's the passenger. Well, the chariot is actually the body. The horses are the senses, the reins are the mind. The driver is the intelligent intelligence and the passenger is the soul. The soul never touches the material energy, but it's being dragged by the material mind and intelligence into different phases. Therefore, in Krishna consciousness, one has to very diligently keep conscious of the, of the movements of the mind and move the mind in the right direction. In other words, in devotional service. And that takes a lot of practice. We hear from Arjun in the same chapter, he says, Chanchalam Himanap Krishna Pramati Balabad Dridha Tasyaham Nigaman Manye Bayuridam Saduskaram. That he's talking to Krishna. He says, My dear Lord, you're asking me to control the mind, but I think it's like trying to control the wind. It's turbulent, unsteady, and it is very difficult to control. Krishna listens very carefully and he, li and he responds in the next verse. And he agrees, he acknowledges um, Arjuna's statement, but he does say, Abhyasena tukunteya vairagya chagriyate, that yes, you can control the mind through constant practice and detachment from material activities. And so people try to control the mind. They can do that if they practice because the mind is a conditioned element. We're, we're with the same mind that we've had for countless amounts of births. When the soul, when the soul goes from one body to another, it it's being carried by the subtle body, which consists of the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. So that same mind is there life after life after life. And uh, what we have in terms of our understanding of our own mind is the awareness that we, we experience in our day-to-day -day activities. But the mind is much more complex than that. The features of the mind lie mostly in the unconscious aspects of the mind. Uh, there are two aspects of the mind, conscious and unconscious. So in the unconscious is all of the experiences, emotions, and desires that we have been connected with from time immemorial, many, many lives. But what comes up in our consciousness 
in our day to day is what we are doing or what we are involved with, which is only a small percentage of the material that's in that's in the mind or the information that is in the mind. So we might compare the mind to a computer. It's actually uh, computers were designed based on by based on studying the nature of the mind. So the computer has what it has on the screen. But you know, within the hard drive of the computer, there's much more information than what you see on the screen. Simply by pushing different buttons, different things appear. So in the same way, thing, when we are using our mind in the material world, we come in contact with different sense objects and different impressions and different memories and different desires are automatically triggered by these different experiences we have. And many of them come from the unconscious to the conscious by the stimuli that comes in the external environment. So this is a little technical, but it's good to know because the mind is the central part of the yoga system. And then it is explained that, uh, that there are three ways that a devotee controls their mind. One is to be fully engaged in devotional service, and then the mind is controlled. The other one is to meditate or think about the instructions given by the spiritual masters, by the Lord. And that is another form of mind control. When we think about and um, uh, meditate upon what Krishna has said, what the spiritual master has said, and we start to understand deeper. And of course, that leads to activity also. But that's another form of mind control. And the third one is less def definitive, but it's also a form of mind control. And that is to uh, work for the benefit of others. Of course, we do that in Krishna consciousness. That is called outreach, preaching, teaching, like that. So that is another way to keep the mind controlled is to use your abilities, time, resources, and whatever to help others come to the spiritual platform like that. So that is also a form of mind control. This is mentioned. But we should always know that the mind can take you away at any time. We have the examples in the Shastras. A very nice young man, he was very... Uh, Pious, also very religious, and uh, walking along the street one day, he uh, saw something that disturbed his mind, and at the same time it attracted his mind. The Sudra and the Sudrani, a low-class man and women, were embracing in public. This person was known as Ajamil. When he saw that, his mind became attracted. And then he became, he started to seek out the association of that lady who was a prostitute. And eventually he married him. And his whole life was centered around uh, providing everything that she needed to live luxuriously. And of course, he had a family. And then we know how he got saved by Krishna's mercy at the end. But ultimately, here's an example of how just a little impression that comes at a certain time and once uh, can affect the consciousness of a devotee in such a way that it becomes hard to rebring that consciousness back to Krishna. Um, it's just the way the impressions of the material energy, and especially when those impressions are connected to the emotional aspect of the being, and then the impressions have strong imprints. It's almost like a tattoo that is impressed upon this, the body. It stays there. And one has to be very diligent and keeping the mind fixed in devotional service. Otherwise, um, it all, it, the mind can destroy you. As Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati makes a very strong statement about the mind. He says, the, your mind is a non-devotee. And Prabhupada also kind of enunciates that part by saying, never trust your mind. Always distrust it. 
because you never know where it might go next. And so always keep a watch, just like mentioned in the Bhagavatam, in the sixth chapter of the fifth canto, there are a series of verses on the spoken about the mind. And one of the verses is just like when you catch a wild horse, now you have to control that horse so it doesn't run away again. So you tie it very carefully to a post. So in the same way, when the mind becomes controlled, one has to watch it very carefully because it may at any time destroy the yogi. And we have the example of Subari Muni, which is mentioned in the ninth canto. He was a great meditator, great Muni. He was meditating underwater for many, many years, and he had become very, very powerful in his yoga practice. But then he just happened to see two fishes together in a very sensual way. And then he, his mind became disturbed with that. So much so that it destroyed his meditation. And he eventually left that and so, sought out a, a marriageable partner. And of course, he got married to 50 girls. That's a whole different story. But the example is there that Here's a great Muni. And then all of a sudden, everything changes. So this is this is how the mind is chanchala, as Arjun makes, mentions to Krishna. It's flickering, very steady. So the way to keep the mind controlled and to fortify the mind's control is to keep very, very good sadhana. Chanting of the holy names of the Lord, reading Srila Prabhupada's books, especially Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, and uh, worshiping the deity form of the Lord, which is especially uh, recommended for those living in Grihastha life because of their responsibilities outside of their uh, realm of Krishna consciousness, taking care of family and working in the external environment. The deity worship is essential. So these give strength, they give enthusiasm, they give uh, clarity of vision when we are dealing in the day-to-day -day world. So one has to keep very, very strong sadhana. Otherwise, the mind will cheat you, can cheat you at any time. And we see how people wind up doing something or saying something that they regret later on because they allowed the mind to pull, pull them in that direction. So, uh, and that is a very commonplace uh, event that happens often, even within the circle of Vaishnava. So, um, again, the mind is our friend or the mind is the enemy. And uh, there are many, many verses and many, many recommendations throughout the scriptures to help us uh, understand the nature of the mind and how it works and how it can be controlled and how to uh, and not allow it to do whatever it wants whenever it wants. So this is a very important, although as Prabhupada writes one line, this is most essential for happiness that the mind has to be Control. Otherwise, one cannot practice Krishna consciousness effectively, progressively. One has to become determined. Arjuna's mind just jumped away from Krishna. And all of a sudden, when he was on the battlefield, he fell into this state of lamentation, thinking that why should he have to fight because there's no benefit in the fight. Although Krishna was there to inspire him in the fight, and he had already agreed, all of a sudden, his mind told him something different. And now Krishna had to speak the entire Bhagavad Gita in order to bring him back to his on, to the correct understanding. But he had everything correct prior to this happening, but he allowed his mind to cheat him. So the mind will do that. The mind will just like sometimes we're sitting there and we're, we're having a nice meal, and then all of a sudden someone brings something else, 
And then you say, oh, that's very nice too. They say, yeah, please try it. Oh, yeah. And then something else comes and the mind gets attracted to that. And after a while, you found up you ate too much. And then you're feeling unhappy. Before you were enjoying a nice meal, now you're suffering from overeating because you allowed the mind to somehow tempt you in the wrong way. So how do we control the mind? By the intelligence. The intelligence is the discriminating factor, which is also a feature of the mind, but is a little bit more subtle in the mind. And it can bring the mind in different directions. So the intelligence is uh, the, the uh, savior of the conditioned souls or the devotee. But that cell intelligence has to be purified by transcendental knowledge. And what does that mean? It has to be directed by something that is spiritual. In other words, if the intelligence is also like the mind, then you have two enemies working against you and it becomes very difficult. But when the intelligence is being harnessed and directed towards topics about Krishna or devotional service, it can, can keep the mind fixed in the process of devotional service very nicely. Jiva Goswami mentions that. I think it's Rupa Goswami who mentions that the connection between the soul and uh, God is the feature of the intelligence. And Prabhupada emphasized that. That's why he gave us so much knowledge to stimulate our intelligence in the right way and understand how to use the intelligence to bring the soul connected to the Supreme Lord Krishna in devotional service. So these are some features of the mind. We can speak about the mind all day because there's so much information there. Srila Prabhupada has given us um, many, many guidelines in one particular purport, which is the very beginning of the purport. He talks about the nature of the restless mind, and then he gives a very simplified statement, which is quite profound. He says there's one easy way to control the mind, and then the answer is neglect. Learn how to neglect the demands of the mind. The mind says, do this, go here, I want this. Say something to that person. Uh, mind is always, you know, dictating to us, the soul, what we should be doing next. And this, of course, the mind is being fueled by the false ego, which is the uh, the misidentification of the the soul with the body. And therefore, the false ego, in a very subtle way, control directs the mind, bring the mind into the contact with the material senses for some kind of satisfaction, material satisfaction. So it's a very great science. If we can study the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, especially, and there's many, many verses also in the Bhagavatam, Krishna also speaks directly about this subject matter in the 11th canto, where he say, explains that controlling the mind is like controlling a horse. He says, while you're riding on a horse, you, in order to control the horse, you have the reins. Now, the reins are the element by which you direct the horse. But if you pull the reins too hard, the horse will buck and jump. And if you let the reins go too loosely, the horse will go wherever it wants to go. So Prabhupada Krishna explains that one has to very carefully guide the mind towards the activities of devotional service. If we try to force the mind, sometimes we might find the more mind will jump back and become less controlled. And if you so it's a it's a balance between and using the example of riding on a horse is a perfect example. Krishna explains that in the, I think it's in the twenty, the nineteenth chapter of the of the eleventh canto. So, uh, therefore, if you carefully understand Srila Prabhupada's books, you'll see that there is a lot of uh, 
information given on the importance of controlling the mind because it's the basic principle of the yoga system. Uh, so uh, it requires practice. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, then, uh, Maharaj. Uh, wonderful class. Uh, wonderful class. And it was such an important topic, the mind, which is always out of control. And we always try to, you know, control. But uh, the, like mind is chanchala, what you said. And it's so true. It's jumping all the time. You know, it's so chanchal. And so to bring the mind in control, we have to be so diligent in Krishna consciousness. And to control, we need to practice uh, instruction given by our spiritual master and the Lord and to meditate on it and to help the others to, you know, um, come to sp uh, spiritual platform. We need to be really diligent, but it's very difficult. I know it's so difficult. But thank you so much for the wonderful class. I won't waste any more time and we, I would give the opportunity to others to ask questions. Um, do you have time, Maharaj? Oh, yes. We have okay. We and before I put the questions, Maharaj, I have a, a message from Nina Mataji. You must be wondering today, Nina Mataji is not here because she is in India. Her father is unwell and she's requested you to pray for her father for good health. Yes, so I just wanted to give this message to you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Maharaj. Best wishes to. Uh... May the Lord's mercy fall upon Nina's father. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I'm sure she'll be. Okay, um, devotee, uh, Hare Krishna, Sri uh, Isopanishad uh, Mataji, please uh -huh. go ahead. Hare Krishna. Uh -huh. Dhanavat Pranams, all glories to your wonderful divine service, Maharaj. How are you? <laughs> Hare uh, Krishna. Chai. We're here in America. <laughs> you are here in America. I've been noticing you've been getting around. I just can't get to come to to touch your lotus feet. <laughs> you know, I can't catch up with you at all. You're moving around so much. But we'll it's be a, we'll be at Gita Nagari on the first, second, and third of June. Well, I will get to see you. Hari Hari Bo, Maharaj. You are so very, very missed. Uh, thank you again for uh, allowing me the opportunity to just see your face right now. Hari Hari Bo, Hari Krishna. Dandavat. Thank you, Sri Yashupanishad. <laughs> thank you, Mati. Yes, it is really very fortunate for us to you know, at least uh, see Maharaj. You know. So, um, devotees, any more questions? Please go ahead and mute yourself. Any realization? Yes, Megam Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danvat Pranam. Please accept my humble obeisances to Sagar Shishila Prabhupada and Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga. Uh, Maharaj, wonderful, wonderful class, very simple to understand and very, as Adit Mataji said, very important topic of the mind. <clears throat> My question to you is about, um, you know, we hear that for a devotee, the mind plays tricks saying, you know, why, why do your sadhana so, so hard? Um, and then it makes you fall. But then at the same time, you had also mentioned that, <clears throat> you know, the mind, we should not be doing something strongly because otherwise it will fall back down uh, and be not controlled. So I'm trying to understand what is the good medium? Like, you know, because practicing somewhere it does, you have to, you know, it's, it's not bad force, but you have to endeavor. And that endeavor, it, it is something like, you know, practicing to try to divert the mind consistently. So it's not forcing, but at the same time, you, you can't, be just easy going and let the mind take its time to come to devotional service, right? So what is a good good medium uh, to help us stabilize in devotional service and, and sadhana uh, and, and have a better understanding of like, you know, when, what is not 
too much uh, strong on, on yourself because you don't want to become hard hearted. Um, but at the same time, not too soft either that you, you know, you try being, you know, it's, it's okay to not have all the rounds done in the morning, for example, you know, like you do 12 out of the 16, all, all these kinds of things, you know, that they happen. So um, how do we find that good medium, Maharaj? Well, that medium might be different from person to person. So you have to see or experience and then understand how to organize your day in such a way that you have balance in whatever activities you need to perform. So you have to give quality time to practicing Krishna consciousness. And that quality time is essentially our sadhana. Yes. Hearing and chanting, our reading, our worship, and also our association with devotees. All of that is foundational to purify the mind, which allows the mind to become more easily controlled. So um, I would say strong sadhana. That is, and then Krishna also <laughs> emphasizes that when he responds to Arjuna's question about the uh, the unsteady mind, he says, you also have to stop trying to enjoy this material world at the same time. You're still trying to, if you're trying to mix material life and spiritual life in the sense that you're trying to still find happiness in material activities, then uh, you won't be able to control the mind because the mind will be going back and forth between the two. And finding as much, and the mind will try to get as much pleasure as it can from every, anything it goes into. So one has to understand that as devotees, our happiness is in the activities of devotional service. and But we have responsibilities, maybe with family and occupation, so we have to do that. But we should never see these as as the sources of happiness. There are the responsibilities that we have to take care of in order to live, set a foundation for our activities in this material world. They're necessary. That's all. But happiness is on the spiritual platform, and therefore, oh. when the mind is engaged in spiritual activities, we can experience transcendental happiness, or that happiness. Yeah. It's not dependent on on external activities, but it's dependent of our only on our connection with with the, with devotional activities. That's all. Yeah, so, so that's that's a good point, uh, Maharaj. But like my my question, in addition to is also, you know, doing the sadhana. You say this, you have to have a strong sadhana. But sometimes while doing sadhana and then different services, right? For example. We, we might have a reading time, but then because there's services that we're also, you know, services mean not, not the home services, but like even temple services. Um, sometimes they take up the time from that reading time that you might have. Um, and then your body is really, you know, tired sometimes. And then you can't do all that chanting in the morning because of the, the tiredness. Yeah, we all, like we, we, yeah, especially those of us who are, Elderly, we experience that tiredness that comes in the morning quite easily. So you have to balance, see how, how best you can function. Sometimes you have to put a little pressure on the mind to get it to go a little bit farther. But then again, when it gets to the point of becoming too difficult, then it's better to do something else and then go back to the chanting and the reading. Um, so these are practical suggestions. Everybody might uh, understand these suggestions differently according to their particular situation. But basically, the principle is that uh, Krishna consciousness requires some effort, and that effort has to be directed in a way that we are actually connecting with the activities that we're performing. If, our, if we're trying to connect and we're not connecting, then we have to do something in order to reconnect. In other words, sometimes 
we're doing devotional service, but our minds are somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the mind is somewhere else, thinking about what it wants to do later or what happened yesterday or whatever. So, therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever and wherever the mind wanders due to its unsteady and flickering nature, one should bring it back under the control of the self. So the intelligence is that factor that pulls the mind back. And so you have to make your intelligence strong. If, you don't, if your intelligence is weak, then the mind will overshadow the intelligence. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you so much, Maharaj. That's definitely helpful. And thank you for coming to um, the Sun Naperville. I had met you um, when you were, you were sitting. Uh, so uh, thank you and keep, keep blessing us with your association, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, you Megha Mataji, for that uh, question. We always, everybody has the same question, you know, when I mean, we are so tired sometimes, you know, doing services. Next morning, it's so difficult to wake up, like, you know, same goes with me. You know, we had Narsimha Jenti. We celebrated in the temple and next morning at 3.30, my eyes wouldn't open. The alarm is going, you know, but, uh, but then we try. I just tried to focus and woke up. I said, no, this is the time. I will wake up. But uh, I think yeah, Maharaj said the right thing that sadhana, sadhana is so important to progress, you know, in Krishna consciousness. That is my experience also, waking up at Brahma Murat and doing that sadhana is something so divine, you know, so all we can do is try and try you know, until we get there. You know, we don't know when, but yeah, trying and sadhana. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Please bless and yeah. bless me and uh, pray for me that I can continue and mm -hmm. progressing in devotional service, Maharaj, and devotees. Mm -hmm. Your effort in devotional service, although maybe not ideal, are still counted by Krishna as bhakti. So bhakti works in such a way as your efforts are also bhakti. It's not so much the results. We want the results because ultimately... That's the goal. But at the same time, coming to that, that goal is also bhakti. So in a material world, when you do something, you either get it right or you don't. But in spiritual life, your endeavor to perform activities is just as good as any as the success of the activities. Krishna responds to our effort. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Mataji, for thank you, Maharaj, for that beautiful answer. Uh, Hare Krishna, Wali Mataji. Please go ahead. She's been waiting for quite some time. Yes, Mataji, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Mataji, Danvat Pranam. Thanks for uh, taking my question. And Maharaj, Danvat Pranam, it was so nice meeting you also in the Naperville Temple. We are all so blessed to see you. We are all so excited. I'm showing you to my parents here. They are from India. They just came last week. So I, I'm telling that I, we all met Maharaj in the temple here in Naperville. Uh, so we are so fortunate, Maharaj. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, today's class was so, so uh, confusing and sometimes it is uh, uh, informative. Uh, until now, we are thinking that intelligence is the part that gives strength and uh, to take a right decision and we have to get away of the mind because it is uh, always uh, uh, forced and uh, uh, controlled by the senses. But uh, today's class, I heard that you say that intelligence is also come sometimes uh, having the negative effects, the negative intelligence will destroy. If both mind and uh, negative intelligence are together, it is more dangerous. That's what you said. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate about uh, how the negative intelligence is affecting and what is negative intelligence, Prabhuji? Well, it simply means that the mind and the intelligence are both geared to the, to the material. That's right. Yeah, but intelligence always uh, directs mind towards the right things, right? Intelligence is no, 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 not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily, you mm. have to purify the intelligence also before you can purify the mind, because the intelligence is a director, 
The intelligence is purified by Shastra, by Guru, by instructions of Guru and Shastra. So therefore, you guide the mind through the instructions given by Guru and Krishna through Shastra. And that is the use of the intelligence. So unless we actually purify our intelligence by transcendental knowledge, and the example is called Shastra Chakshush. Chakshush mm. is to see. One has to see life through, through transcendental <coughs> or through, through knowledge. One has to see through knowledge. Okay. And simply by, you know, what you see out there. So otherwise knowledge will also be contaminated sometimes. Yeah, it is. Because until the, until the intelligence is at least Somewhat fixed higher knowledge. Otherwise, it'll the intelligence and the mind will be dragging you in the same direction. But the intelligence is a discriminating factor. And okay, that's the, that has the discrimination. But if you do material discrimination, then you're not gaining anything. If you do spiritual discrimination. Then you are again, then you can pull the mind back and guide it in the right direction. Okay, Maharaj. The, the mind has certain characteristics, the intelligence also. The mind is thinking, feeling, willing. The intelligence is discrimination, determination. So you have to apply discrimination in a determinate way, guided by knowledge, shastra, guru. Otherwise, you're subject to the mind. And if the intelligence is not purified, then you have two enemies working against you. <laughs> uh, Krishna, so so wonderful explain, Maharaj. Thank you, thank you very much. Nice. Uh, please uh, shower your blessings upon us, Maharaj. So if we read Prabhupada's books, mm -hmm. hear the lectures, then the intelligence becomes purified. And also hearing to your lectures also, Maharaj, the morning classes are so, so helpful every morning. As Mega Mataji said, uh, sometimes we are like uh, having a, a rough time in the mornings. That, then this is the only way that we can keep our track with these classes and listening to your lectures. So, so happy, man. Thank you, Bali Mataji. It's very true. When we listen to Maharaj, we get purified. And you all are so lucky. I'm yeah. so <laughs> We met all other Matajis also, Mega Mataji, Nina Mataji, Yamshmati Mataji, all, all the devotees from Chicago were there in the temple that day. We are so happy to meet and we are discussing about the morning sessions what we, where we come together. You are so fortunate that you could have the darshan of Maharaj in person, you know, Dandavat Pranam. Thank you. And I see Ishu Nishab Mataji's hand raised again. Is it from before or you no, have? This, this is another wonderful time. <laughs> I actually have a question this time. Maharaj, I love it how you said you have to neglect the mind. That is so you know, wonderful for me to, I can put that in my uh, everyday daily chores. Uh, the mind is so, you know, so very powerful. It has control all of the time. And when you said neglect it, I can understand that. I get a better scenario of how to do that. And when you're pulling the reins, those reins, you have to be really careful because if you pull too hard, it will, it will break on you. It would, you know, it, 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 you use a term. What did you use? You said it will um, bounce back or something like that or? Jump. Jump, yeah. Yeah, it will <laughs> jump. So, um, and uh, so it requires effort. I understand that, you know. At this age, I'm still bouncing back, you know, jerking back and forth. And uh, again, the mind is just very, very powerful. So when you said neglect it, that just seems to me to resonate with that a lot more. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> thank you thank you uh, devotees if uh, you have any realization or questions please go ahead and mute yourself hi krishna maharaj please accept my humble obeisances i wish to share a call good to you maharaj we are you know okay. waiting for you to come here to shalak <laughs> and uh, thank you so much maharaj for the class uh, it's very difficult to control the mind and even though we we practice it it comes back again and again it's just uh, it's very true that he mind is uh, completely non devotee and we should not listen to him neglect the mind it's very perfect thank you so much Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, whatever you think about at the time of death, that's what you attain. Yam yam bhapi sparam bhavam taktu ante kalevalam. So if you don't practice mind control now, when the time of death comes, you won't be able to think of Krishna. It's not possible. So the life is preparing us ultimately for leaving the body. And when we think of Krishna at the time of death, and then it says, Krishna says, whatever you think of, that's where you attain. But it's not so easy to think of Krishna at the time of death if we haven't been, been preparing our whole life to do that. So we have to practice. That's why devotional service is simply preparing us to leave the body and then attain the perfection, and that is go back to the spiritual world. But that means there's determination. The mind has has caused so many great persons to fall down. And so, even persons who are very elevated on the spiritual platform, a little inattention in the wrong way, can again cause them to take another birth in this material world. You have the example of Bart, Bart Maharaj. He was he had given up everything. He was the king of the world. And then he left it all. He went to the forest for meditation. He was on a very high spiritual platform. He had reached the stage of bhava, just the preliminary stage of love of God. He's in the forest. He sees a deer. She's drinking water from the stream. All of a sudden, a lion roars very loudly. And it causes the deer to get, become afraid. So she jumps across the stream. And that deer was pregnant. And then the, the baby doe came out of the womb of the deer. And the mother deer died because of the fright of she, that she heard from the lion. And uh, now there was a baby doe. So he, being compassionate, decided to take care of the doe. And so he did. But the only thing, there was nothing wrong in taking care of the doe. The only thing wrong was that he neglected his spiritual life in order to do that. So he gave up his worship, his prayers, his meditation, everything that he had been practicing. He concentrated fully on that deer, that doe. And, and the story is quite long. And then at one point, when he left his body, he had developed an affection for that deer. And then in his next life, he took the body of a deer. But because he was such a great devotee, and he had slipped by accident, Krishna gave him the understanding that he could remember why he took the body of a deer. And in that body of a deer, he didn't hang with the other deers. He would go by the sages and listen to them speak transcendental knowledge. And then in his next life, he took birth as Judd Bart. And that is, you, you can read them. And in that chapter about Judd Bart, there are so many verses about the nature of the mind. And so here's a prime example how a great soul, you know, very elevated, but a little... Mm, misunderstanding of how to perform his in other words he became unduly affectionate to a baby deer and then forgot about everything else so it says a devotee is by nature kind 
And so they want to help others in distress. So that wasn't wrong, but he allowed himself to become absorbed in that at the expense of giving up his spiritual practice. And that cost him two more births. And then eventually, as Jad Bharat, he acted like a dullard, not so he wouldn't have to associate with people in the material world. He acted like deaf, dumb, and blind. Mm. And he did everything in that mood when people just simply rejected him, thinking he was just completely, you know, an idiot. But he was on the highest transcendental platform, meditating on the Lord constantly. But everyone saw him as some as some some uh, dummy who couldn't function. But he did that so he wouldn't become again attracted to the material world. And then, of course, the story goes on how he instructed that great king. Uh, forgot his name. But he he gave he seemed that so King Rahugana, right. He instructed King Rahugana in the science of bhakti. So um, here's the, so we can learn from the scriptures how one who fails to control the mind, what are some of the results? So we can learn from the success. We have to read the scriptures. We have to hear from the acharyas regularly. If we don't, our spiritual life will not develop beyond a certain point. And we'll again take up material activities as we find some kind of satisfaction in, in our life. Where it's important that we read and hear these, these, these books regularly. It's like medicine. It's not like medicine, it's more like food. Yeah. And it's nourishment. The spiritual, just like we get nourishment from food when we eat every day. So in the same way, we need to get spiritual nourishment by hearing transcendental knowledge and uh, understanding that knowledge and learning how to apply that knowledge in our practice. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, but it's a joyful process if we accept it enthusiastically. Mm -hmm. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maharaj. That was a beautiful you know, answer. We, we struggle in day-to-day -day life, but we have to listen to the scriptures. We need mm -hmm. to read. Very true. Until we do that, we will be again bewildered. You know, thank you so much. Um, devotees, uh, if uh, you don't have any more questions, with the permission of Shamaguri Mataji, maybe we can conclude the class today. One, one raise hand. Oh, okay. Raj Prabhu. Yes, Raj Prabhu. Pranam, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, on, on this topic of controlling the mind being so difficult, I've been following your previous advice from previous classes where you just said just focus on Krishna all the time so I was just like focusing on Krishna all the time and even when you have to focus on activities that you can concentrate on I can still have the holy names on in the background and I find it works you don't have to worry about the mind the rascal mind it just falls in line because you're focused on Krishna and it doesn't bother you. And it's pretty wonderful most of the time. The only downside that I find is that you tend to get more broken sleep because you're still thinking about Krishna in your, at night. <laughs> That's not a downside. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Maharaj. It's another side of the upside. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's, uh, thank you. That was very instructive what you just said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Devoot.
questions if we okay. have we can conclude this class and let us pay our obeisances um, maharaj thank you so much sandeep pranam again to you and we are so fortunate to have you to enlighten us today uh, the class and with a very important topic we look forward to your association again maharaj please bless us that we can you know continue this devotional service with concentrating you know our mind and controlling our mind uh, let's pay our obeisances महाराज वंश कल्पतरूपस्थ